Hi everyone. Um, today is my first recording for our Patreon meetup at the end of every month. Um, I'm with my apprentices right now and um, we are going to be looking at homework that I assigned at the beginning of this month. It's a photo study and a character lineup design uh, that assesses kind of um, a student's understanding of weight distribution and a character design, silhouette studies and all of that. Uh, so we're going to be taking a look at those and um, I have my students here. Um, so they're going to introduce themselves really quickly. It's okay, don't be shy. It's just really, really, you know, just like as if no recorder was on. Um, and uh, they're going to introduce themselves, talk a little bit about what they do. They're also going to submit their own personal pieces for portfolio review. And we're going to try to see if there are errors in their personal work that are reflected in the assignments as well. And maybe they have an idea of where to start and what to focus on, um, you know, very, very... Um, uh, like attentively in, in their in their portfolios and see if there's any one mistake that is consistent throughout. So sorry, R RJ, go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> <clears throat> Hi, um, I've been drawing for at least two years. Mm -hmm. uh, I've dropped it a lot and um, yeah. recently picked it up back up because um, I just felt like, uh, you know, I should just pick it up again. Why did you drop it? Was it because like a frustration or? Was yeah. It, yeah. A lot of it was, I didn't really have a good excuse. I just kept putting it off. Mm -hmm. And when I saw your channel, it just, it helped me a lot to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I knew I could push myself a lot further if I actually tried yeah. more. Yeah. And like trying efficiently, like knowing what to focus on, not just trying generally. It's usually what yeah. I try to, you know. Promote. Deliberate practice. Exactly, yeah. Um, Klar, yeah? Klar, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, uh, but please go ahead with your intro. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Klar Jim, and mm -hmm. I uh, draw and I paint, mm -hmm. and I really want to become better at uh, digital drawing, because mm -hmm. I've uh, always kind of just been... Uh, yeah, I'm messing about without really, really knowing what I'm doing, and I want to try and improve that. And I, uh, I'm an actress as well. Oh wow! As well, and um, yeah, I do translations and uh, all kinds of stuff. But I really like uh, doing artwork. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I want to really properly learn the basics. Um, yeah. Um, nice to meet you guys. Uh, Dan, go ahead. I don't. I, well, I know Dan, but he's gonna have to introduce himself <laughs> to the viewer. Hi, Hi I'm Dan. Um, Hi. I'm. I, I'm in college right now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm studying languages. I speak Spanish, but I really enjoy drawing and painting. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of focus on portraits. I really like capturing uh, people's faces. Um, and I basically just want to improve my portraiture uh, mm -hmm. and work on the realism, <clears throat> mm -hmm. the realism aspects of it. And yeah, I've been drawing for a while, but I only really started seriously um, drawing probably since last September, I'd say. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, Julia, go ahead. Oh, Julia. Julie doesn't have a mic on their PC. Oh, okay. Oh. Kara's um, mic is broken. Oh, no. Um, do they have a written intro for me? I was going to um, read Kira. It's okay. Uh, Julia, did you want to write something for us? And I can just read it for you. It's okay. Uh, Kira, you can go ahead if you're comfortable. Oh, um, they can't, as they well. can't either. Okay, all right, I'll read it for them. Hi, I'm Kira. I've been drawing as long as I can remember, but never really super serious about it. But I realized drawing is pretty much the only thing I really enjoy doing, um, and uh, it's art, so I would love to try and work with it. I think I got too comfortable being mediocre at art because I was always surrounded by people who weren't really into art. Mm -hmm. and I probably always complimented you. They never really, you know, gave you proper critique, and so you got kind of stuck in that quicksand. So finding the community really helps me. <clears throat> That's so good. That's so good. Um, I can relate 100%, Abu says. Um, and then uh, Link, go ahead. Hi, I'm Link. Uh, I've, been, <laughs> I've been drawing for seven months now mm -hmm. and painting. Mm -hmm. And I'm more into illustrator style mm -hmm. things. So that's what I'm trying to improve. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. So how many of you here find that character design is really important to you and drawing a portrait is important? How many of you have kind of steered away from the portrait, you're not so concerned about the portrait and you want to focus on like landscapes or something like that? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, character design is something I've looked at in the past, but I really am focused on portraiture, I'd say. And so the mm -hmm. one assignment using trend lines was really good for me because um, mm -hmm. I started using them more in other portraits I was doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt the same way. Yeah. yeah. It's like a tool I didn't know was something I could use. Mm -hmm. so it helped a lot. Um, anyone for uh, landscapes or uh, environment design or anything like that? Or interested in it at Hello. least? <clears throat> interested, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. Clarcha, I'm sorry. Yeah, it would always help to, to mm -hmm. line up more, too, because I've always been kind of lacking uh, mm -hmm. environments, so it's, yeah. it's good. So um, some of the assignments I'm going to be covering with you guys, so this month, actually for February, is going to be the character design assignment that we're doing in our um, community. Um, so I'm going to actually have you guys design your own, uh, uh, like, a champion or the ancient weapon champion. Um, which is going to have a little bit, it's going to be a little bit more different than what we have in the uh, general um, community. I'm going to make yours a little bit more specific. I'm going to give you kind of more variety in the gender and the culture, but it's still going to be based on the same style of character design. So that's going to be a little bit more open and fun for you guys. But for the upcoming challenges, the challenge for March is surely going to be a book cover. Um, and I'm going to give you as if I am the <clears throat> employer and I'm the writer and I'm like requesting a book cover of a character and an environment and so some of the some of the hand-ins for the homework are going to include thumbnails of environments but in a vertical landscape of course because it's a book cover oh wow I'm so hyped <laughs> Dan says, <laughs> yeah. um, I thought you'd make us do a 14-day challenge well beside every single so for February's um, homework you're gonna have another photo reference study um, photo reference studies and 14 day challenge, um, even form studies, I always make a staple homework because uh, in the backdrop there always has to be some kind of grayscale, low creative pressure study that exposes you to as many form signatures as possible. Um, so that's always going to be a staple in our homework. It's never just going to be one thing. Um, just like we had the character design sheet this month, I also have you look at um, trend lines and being able to duplicate what you see in a reference, reading uh, the forms, uh, signatures in your reference. Um, so you're always going to have 14-day challenge uh, additives. Um, All right. Okay, so what I'm going to be... Um, <clears throat> sorry, one second. Okay, so I'm going to be taking a look at these. So you guys can't see my screen yet, but in the recording when I post it, you'll be able to see it. Um, it's going to be hard for me to find out whose homework it is. So I'm going to have to go over into homework submission. Unless I find somewhere where we can, like how many of us are here? Um, I can probably get you guys to see my screen, but the more that, the more that we like, populate, the less um, this will be possible. Um, so what I'm going to ask you guys to do is, because sound is so much better on Discord, some of your mics might actually start picking up sound in a weird way on Google Hangouts. But I'm going to give you a Google Hangout link to join me in, and then you guys can see my screen. Okay. So there's... Okay. Um, so you, if you want to mute Google Hangouts, you can, um, and just see my screen through that. So you can mute Google Hangouts completely, um, so that we can stay here in the Discord chat, because the sound is so much more clear. <clears throat> so I'm going to mute mine. Open volume mixer. My weird ass anime face. Oh gosh. I have to change, <laughs> have to change it. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Let me know when you guys can see it. Oh, yep. Where are All you sharing the links? Um, the link is just, uh, where did I throw the link in? Um, oh, it's in general. Yeah, it's in general. <clears throat> Is yeah. this um, real time? Yes, this is real time. Okay. Yeah. We have a, quite a bit of time to do oh, this. I like these. Let me know if everyone is in there who's not in there yet. <clears throat> um, open link. Okay. I'm just. Uh, 
setting this up. Okay, so that's the homework. And then um, I'm going to talk about the homework really quickly. So I'll close all this. Um, can you all see my screen? <coughs> yeah. Yes. And you're all muted, right? I'll mute yep. myself there too. Yeah. Okay, so the homework for this month was to, using these references, was to create a character design lineup based on distribution of weight. So what I did was I gave the students random shapes uh, as templates um, to distribute characters. So right over here, I kind of threw the weight towards the bottom but left the head big. Um, as, and as you can see, basically the lesson is that usually all the head sizes are the same. So some of you in your character designs, I'm not sure which one um, it was. There was one that I saw. Uh, I think it was this one. Um, where the head size was, um, what well, you drew it as if it was a child. Um, so because the head sizes were all so similar to each other, the only one that would have been younger would have been this one. So head sizes are a great indication of age. Um, this one's head size was actually pretty large, but you could have interpreted this as the head size. It could have been some sort of crouched or, or fallen gesture or something very uh, forward crouching or something with leaning forward. Um, so I was looking for consistency in head sizes. I was also the, 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 uh, if I were to read really quickly here, let me grab it. Okay. So the shape templates are guides on mass di distribution. When we use these preset templates, we're making rules we have to work within that define the body type. So these are preset body types you have to, uh, kind of use as inspiration for your character and their narrative. Instead of leaving this to the final sketch layer, we blueprint like this to help prepare us for body type and character that and the character that the body type represents. So every character body type comes with a role which comes with a personality. Um, and if you blueprint all this stuff early on, you're less susceptible to mistake making or uncanniness. So uncanniness was actually one of the first things I noticed um, in this submission. Where are you? In this submission because you're using basically the personality is very young child um, dress, uh, those those little uh, hair, I'm not sure what they're like, pigtails or something. I'm not sure what the style is called, but um, you're throwing off the body type and height uh, to be as if it was a very overgrown child. And overgrown child is always going to be uncanny. Um, and it's always going to be uh, a little bit off the top. So if we can look at um, the uncanniness of the overgrown baby in Spirited Away, that was very deliberate. And the fact that he has so much strength, the fact that he was aggressive, all of that really moved together with the, uh, that overgrown baby proportion. And you create that unusual co combination of really aggressive, almost animosity personality with the silhouette of a baby that's much bigger than everyone else in a side-by-side. -side. So that's, that's, you know, uncanniness done right. And you have to make sure that you are not working in that direction, that when you are trying to design characters as if you were, and the best way to design characters is to set them beside each other because that way you understand what role each character is playing, playing with their body type and personality in relation to others. You can't design major characters in a story out, outside of each other or away from each other because when you put them beside each other again, it's just so weird. Usually the styles are different. There's no consistency in line weight if it was line art. Um, if it was a specific animation style. So this study is really a very, very focused um, style that a lot of animation studios use. They start off just like this. Of course, I give you only one layer of the characterization, <clears throat> but uh, it was an excellent way to kind of just focus in on one, one part of the greater process. Um, so uncanniness was one of the first things that came through. Uh, front view is actually what I was looking for. A side view is a little bit of a cop-out, so it wasn't more of a turnaround, it was just a front view. So some of these characters here are kind of getting away with, um, some of the artists are getting away with it not making sense as the template by drawing them from the side. So side view quarter, um, like three quarter view side front facing would have been fine. Uh, so this right here would have been fine, but um, you know, complete side view wasn't acceptable because, of course, these are presentations, you're exhibiting the character. So some of the fundamentals that we learned just by having this template is always design your characters. If you're designing a story for a graphic novel or a whole animated show, design them beside each other so you understand their relationship. And using this kind of structure here that we have 
in this preset, uh, unusual shape set up beside each other, you're designing without even thinking about the character yet. Of course, there is the creative pressure of knowing what the destination, the goal design of these um, silhouettes is. Of course, there's that creative pressure, but it's way less than having to line art starting at the head and line art all the way down without any gesture lines. And I always invite you to dress these shapes with gesture lines. So you're thinking about gesture and silhouette, which is such a massive prevalent um, fundamental here that's caused all of these. Uh, I just found these on Google and I found them to be some of my favorite here. I love what they did with the body types. I love the width um, kind of variety, the height variety. And then this one, of course, is probably one of my favorites. Um, and they also did something very, very significant, which is the silhouette. Uh, and that's that's what we're looking for a silhouette read before we ask what kind of ears the character has or what kind of the Clothing they have we think about the silhouette and the clothing is never something that you bring in later that disrupts the Silhouette these are things that are chosen early on concrete blueprints that you did that you Decided on early and a good designer is one that makes decisions that are final You don't constantly have to go back and edit your decision because then you're just gonna have uh, this free reign kind of attitude in your art and it's not going to go anywhere and anything that reads is accidental. When you blueprint like this, even with the roughest, ugliest lines, that's fine. It doesn't have to be clean line art till your final layer, um, which at this point is, is based off all the structure that you had underneath. Um, when you're blueprinting like this, you're making all the mistakes early on. So if for some reason they had decided that the arms were too short, he would have looked a little bit more silly, less daunting. Um, but they couldn't just make him one big ball, so they had to have areas of relief here and then complete that whole scene. Usually uh, artists are so inclined to make the head at the top of the character. Sometimes the head is beneath the shoulder line, depending on the gesture and characterization. Big brute, um, crouched forward, angry, not necessarily very graceful. Graceful always means neck, very long neck. And anyone that's graceful or athletic or Olympian looking, so those are the first two characters here. Any girls need necks, but, but if they're awkward girls, of course, you would give them the awkward style body type. Um, kind of that Aphrodite body type or that Achilles body type for anyone that is athletic, of course. Um, and then you kind of get away from that perfect curve in younger girls. And that's all stuff that you choose early on when you're, again, that characterization is still there. The intended age, the intended role uh, or job, which is their occupation in the story. It doesn't have to be... Um, anything specific it just is something reflected through their personality and then out of that so the neck here is completely missing because he's not supposed to represent grace he has a big hilarious body type long legs these are memorable characters because of the exaggeration of the features so the question comes up how do you know what to exaggerate how do you know what to reflect and that always goes back to the writing aspect um, if you're a writer then you know exactly what it is you're going for um, are they a bad guy? Or are they a good guy? And out of that, you choose which uh, parts of the human silhouette, the normal proportionate realistic human silhouette, you're going to emit, um, you're going to keep out. Um, so if I was drawing a scientist who was totally a nerd and not necessarily a beauty queen, um, kind of like debonair, uh, 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 double agent or something like that, I wouldn't give them a neck. I wouldn't give them, uh, of course, hair on the head. I wouldn't give them a perfect uh, triangular body. But you see over here, this character can be appealing for a love interest or as a love interest because he does have the triangular body. He is technically beautiful and then you can keep it. Um, none of these characters here in the middle can be love interests in the sense that um, it's more of a mature story. So then again, you have to assess whether or not you're writing for a mature audience or a younger audience and is it going to be based off um, beauty and what the pursuit of beauty is. And then of course you have to really exaggerate the beautiful. Um, so look across all kinds of uh, stories, any character that is the love interest, you have to exaggerate all the male features on them if they're male and all the female features if they're female. You really have no space for that unusual gray area of androgyny. Um, and again, that all goes back to having an exaggerated caricature type uh, read in the silhouette. So some of these are very, very challenging, but you can tell right off the bat that we're going for a child here. I, 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 For me, if I were to reveal what I intended, a very tall scientist type forward crouched character here. And you don't have to draw exactly within these restrictions. You could have just messed with them just a little bit, but you have to generally have the distribution uh, as the original uh, template intended. Over here, this is obviously some sort of 
Um, it could have been an older person with a large head. could have been a hat. It could have been part of a chef's hat. This could have been a big belly. Um, but as long as, again, all of the weight is just distributed to the bottom. So bottom heavy, top heavy, child short, middle heavy, so a short, short tubby child or something like that, something a little bit more awkward. And then, of course, very, very big tank. Um, I threw in this little extra piece. It could have been a costume ad addition. It could have been part of the body. It could have been a beard. Um, and then this one is, would be another older character. You could have also assessed this one to be a little bit more of a kind of a, a top heavy female Aphrodite type body type. So if you threw a leg here, that wouldn't have thrown off the weight. Um, Abu did something really, really beautiful with his. I want to open, open up his one second. Um, and he um, kind of had a lot of fun showing off. He did break some rules, <laughs> um, but he had a lot of fun showing off the um, the different, the ways he uh, he kept some of the lines. So let me raise the opacity all the way up. So he kept the weight, but he kind of used some of the blocks to be part of a weapon or something like that. So this one is one of my favorite right here. I really love the consistent, and I love how when you're designing characters beside each other, you have to keep the style consistent. So they look like mushroom fish people um, with the larger lip and the silly eyes. But as exactly as I intended over here, very, very bottom heavy, top heavy, uh, bottom heavy. And then um, this character, actually, his whole design is that he's in a constant cauldron, which is really funny. And then he didn't get to this one. I believe he had another set over here. This is a side view, but this is kind of what I was going for, though you introduce a little bit extra weight here, which is outside of the intended weight distribution. If you're going to be including a big, like um, like that one big nurse dude from Big Hero 6, what's his name? The big doctor dude? I forget his name. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, he's like a big uh, AI. The Baymax? Yeah, the Baymax. There you go. Um, so you have to be able to, if his belly is a big part of his silhouette, you have to have that in your original shapes um, that you're setting up. So this is a, a style of character design that I encourage you guys to pursue all the time. I love what you did here. You added, you made it bottom heavy, but you added the legs on either side. You made the character reaching for their sword. Even though they're facing the wrong direction, this is still the right use of um, these kinds of weight distribution uh templates the, some of these are really good some of these you really like pushed it they didn't technically the bottom of the shape wasn't technically the bottom of the uh of the, of the actual uh floor the character was standing on so i love this one and they just got better and better as you went on um so you use the shapes as more of a guide for the focal points which i actually love so the elbow the arm and the head along with the eye that's that's great. You can actually that's wonderful. This use of to guide the focal point, so it doesn't have to be the actual restrictions of the character. It is weight distribution, um, and it's also guiding your focal point, which is just wonderfully done. And these are just some final lines. Okay. As for the uh, photo reference, um, one moment. Does anyone have the original photo reference? I think I uh, I, I don't I have do. it. Yeah. Could you possibly send that over? Yeah. <laughs> go to the announcements and information channel it's still there oh is it okay it's also there yeah oh there, there it is <laughs> what am i saying yeah okay so this was our photo reference piece for our um i'm going to take a little bit more uh, time on the character designs and just talk a little bit more and ask questions for the, uh, the designer behind them but this is the photo reference piece we did for our portrait study um, so I'm going to be looking at that uh, and then assessing side by side, um, you know, what, what was missed, any form signatures that were missing. And then take a look at the personal portfolio pieces and see if there is and ask if there is a consistency in the mistake making across uh, your portfolio. So are there any questions at all so far? Mm, no. No? no? Okay. No. Uh, I'll be right back. Okay, um, so the, the person who designed this, um, so this is the original template to keep in mind. Um, so where are you? And I'm just going to throw it right over. Maybe give it like a different color so we can actually see it. I'm not sure whose mic that is. It's a little bit noisy. Okay, so... 
All right, I'm just gonna duplicate the layer. I need a brighter color that really sticks out. What's going on? <laughs> is that um, like a, <laughs> this is a silly noise. Sounds like a dog trying to enter a house or something. <laughs> um, so, I'm not sure whose this was, so I have to go back and see whose that was. Um, so this was uh, Julia's submission. Um, so Julia, uh, what I see here is when we add in, so you definitely read the body type right, uh, but I think you read it at, well, a couple points too literally. This character is beautiful. I love this character. This is probably your most successful design over here. Um, when you have a character like this where you've got this large block, so you've got all of this and then all of this, um, who's, uh, whose mic is that? Oh, it's, it's Clark, it's Clark Oh, sorry. It's okay. Um, it's okay. You can just mute real quick and then just, uh, just talk with us. Yeah, when, let yeah. me do that. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Um, so you have this large piece over here. You have this large piece. Uh, probably the most graceful thing about this is the hands and the silhouette. I like how you use this as an indication for a female body type, which is really creative. But you kind of missed all of this. And of course, some of these decisions can be edited if these are your original shapes that you set up. Hey, I'm doing an exercise for myself. I'm going to give myself random shapes across the board, and I'm just going to see what I can come up between them. If your weakness is that you don't know how to interpret them, it doesn't it's not a sign of strength a design strength that you have to go back and edit the shape so that it fits what you thought you were designing of course it is a good like it's like a writing prompt but a drawing prompt um it's a good way to get the ball rolling on a character design at least your drawing kind of excuse but still the study is to make you a stronger um design designer and a character designer so you miss this whole circular section so instead of having Instead of having like this whole piece right here, which really reads as nothing, is it like a, is it some sort of um, bag or something? It's really throwing off the, the read here. So what we want to do, and there's no extra shape out here in the original prompt. So what we're going to do is possibly just get rid of this. And when we get rid of this, we kind of get back that very, very feminine curvature. And we can even shrink the waist just a little bit more to read as a little bit stronger. The character proportions are a little bit off. Um, her head is very big, so it's, it is reading as some kind of excessive um, size in, in the head, which kind of might read as a child. It's not because of the, the size of the, you know, the length of her curvature. It's adding to her age, which is good. It's kind of just like making sure we don't read it as a child but the arm is very long. Um, I like what you did with the with the face, how some of it is hidden, but we still have to address this large piece. So what you could have done is it could have been something very simple. Maybe she's some sort of, um, I don't know, like some kind of uh, wintry domain or wintry environment character where you have just a little scarf here to indicate that she's dressed for the, for the, for the location. But I would bring this down just a little bit smaller. So you are allowed to bleed outside of the template but the character design restriction says that you know you're supposed to be thinking about the character like this so now that we have this large shape which isn't technically the same size as this shape but they are in their original prompt um the the indication for like the kind of little hint of um booty in the back um that should have shouldn't have been interpreted as this size but you can still get away with it so all i would request is that you shrink the hand to be a little bit more or the arm, shrink it to be a little bit more proportionate. And, oopsie. So shrinking the arm to be more proportionate, just like that. And then doing something else, kind of with the, uh, with the head, revealing a little bit more of the character's face. Probably choosing some other type of shape, something a little bit less, um, like a hat and more toward the, you know, the design that you're going for. So she has a staff, 
she's got a long a long uh, robe what else can you give her as a headdress that isn't so universal that is the shape isn't so boring that can bring us um, something unique to look at so typical kind of nondescript scarf nondescript character dress nondescript staff really and face isn't showing so what's left you know what's left for the character that we're seeing as the most intriguing thing so if you look at characters in that movie epic so let's go take a look at some of those characters there were like these flower people epic movie images no it's going to give me this ridiculous stuff this one here um so epic movie um animation i guess we can say there we go. So we look at all these characters over here. There's always something to salvage their design. So this is a character design lineup. There's always something new, something weird that they've added. So this princess, very, very typical Disney Barbie kind of body type. Uh, same with her, but there's something added that makes their character pop out a little. So she's supposed to be a modern, typical... Uh, She's pretty much hated in the first half of the movie until she realizes her dad was right the whole time about the fairy people. Uh, but these are the only two of the body type that we have that is basic character design that everyone wants to draw. But there's something added to them. The combat boots, um, the skirt with the leggings made her feel more like a tomboy and less like a typical Barbie. Her waistline, as you can see, is more squared than the princess or the priestess. Um, and her dress is very uh, flowing. It's typical for a princess. And that was easy. That's the easy stuff. But then you look at the villain. Um, they could have given them the tiniest little ears, but take away the ears. He's just really, really basic, nondescript. Not that scary, but with the ears, look at what happened to the silhouette. So when you're thinking about, you know, having one boring shape, large boring shape, large, very typical boring fur hat, what can you do to add that will interrupt all of those repetitive shapes? So you've got very, very curved shapes everywhere. You could have made this point right here to be that little bit of triangle pointiness that could have made the character feel a little bit more interesting and then restricted their head to be inside here and that would have been a lot more of an interesting character to look at because yes you have the typical princess priestess queen body type but then you have some point here to interrupt all the circular shapes um, and you have this all around so you're not experimenting enough with shapes and i feel like this character is the most fun uh, but you did give them a very childlike body, but the face doesn't have enough uh, of the age consistency. Um, so you get to get away with having so many circular shapes over and over again. But in here, you have a lot of chances to create points um, to interpret some of these circular uh, ends as points. So this could have been a circular end here for a robe. Um, you could have finished this off with a circular little additive right here. Um, and that would have helped you add a more intriguing uh, part of the silhouette and more breathing room. Another thing that you have, which is good, which I like to see, um, is breathing room. You do have breathing room here and here between the character. These are all wonderful little um, things that allow the character to feel more interesting from a distance. So you're not just seeing a big blob of a character. You are kind of seeing a big blob of a character here. Uh, so it looks like a woman with a beard. Is this a woman with a beard or is this a man? I'm just going to look at the general chat for the answer. Um, so is this a, a woman with a beard? <clears throat> I'm just waiting. I think Julia's answering. Yeah. By the way, guys, when you hand in, make sure you put your name on your homework. So when I download it from Discord, I know whose homework I'm looking at. <clears throat> but yeah, while well, I'm getting that answer, uh, one thing that would have really helped this character just really stay charming is just a really, really large eye. Um, that would have been very, very helpful to kind of continue that childlike um, uh, kind of impression. So one thing where I've recently seen character design really just so charming is the little Kakariko people. What are they called? Kariko people in Breath of the Wild. Um, yeah. yeah, they're really so interesting. And you can tell when you can, when you, when it's an old Kariko kid and when it's an, an, a young one because of just how they have these, like, I know there was one old one that you get after the Master Sword Trials, and he had all of these, um, you know, extra little old, old person type. He still has the same child body, but he still had this really old, everything was just pointing down, um, eyes were technically smaller. I'm not sure what his name is in order to find the reference to show you guys. 
Uh, but then the young ones had more of like a, a silhouette that was higher along their bodies and the head was higher than the shoulder line. They had more funny looking shapes. Um, they had like half an eye, weird little leaf. Uh, something to be a little bit more interesting and childlike. So you you have templates that are used even when we're talking about crazy designs like this, unheard of designs that are so creative still nonetheless. Uh, but um, yeah, there you go. They feel so childlike and cute. The head size is much larger. Um, that's not the one I was, so, there's this guy. Yeah, definitely, let me show. There's this guy. He's the, You can tell he's young because there weren't any indicators here. The face is gone, but the body's still nice and tubby at the bottom cute little ears but then the old one the old one in the um after you go through the maze uh this one is a completely different species he was like a completely different type of of the love of his maracas dance um but um yeah you could tell right away that it was a child and so you have to continue this child uh like uh setup so what you can do is just shrink and no one will be the wiser no one will no notice that you made these changes because as far as they're concerned, they're, they're, they're seeing a read. Uh, the, the shrinking of the neck didn't kill the character's design. If you really brought it down, then you'll make them feel more like infirmed, not really able to run fast, uh, more tubby, more like the, um, I love the way that, I know it's really basic, but the way they designed um, Humpty Dumpty and Puss in Boots. And of course, script has to do with it. Um, but uh, he was just hilarious. Um, and you can tell he wasn't athletic, but they gave him all this attitude. They gave him this massive attitude problem. And his face had a lot to do with it. They gave him this like really weird adult face on a circle. So you never read that he was a child because his legs were long, right? He never felt like a child. When he was younger, he had short little legs and a shorter, um, less mature, I guess, eye size. His eyes were huge compared to his mouth. But here, they're pretty small compared to his mouth. His mouth is very wide. Um, but the long limbs made him feel like the adult version of himself. And then you have to make sure you're careful with long limbs. So too short neck, that makes him look a little bit older. And then a head that's large with a moderately like visible neck is what will really make that read come through. And the original templates were kind of still being followed. You have a little bit of added weight here on the sides but you still are technically following it. We're closer to the top uh, over here. You could also shrink the whole character so that they're fitting. That last little added piece is fitting right inside and shrink the rest of the body down. So you could do a little bit of this as well and that'll help kind of fit you in. And now it looks, it looks like a, a shorter, stubbier character. And then you get a more complete read. And it's all about completing the read. If your character design is this uncanny, unintentional, accidental combination of random shapes, it will read like that. It won't be charming. It won't, it won't pull in the audience because it's not being backed up by the concrete fundamentals of tropes and the personality and the role that comes with those body types. Um, and every success that you'll have is accidental. So really there's only so many tropes that you have. If they're tall and they're old, they crouch forward. If they're tall and middle-aged and really handsome, they have the typical Aphrodite and Achilles body type. So perfect female, perfect male, not necessarily over-masculine female, which is actually a trope which is going to go for female tank or male tank. Male tank doesn't have a slim kind of like a, like plyometrics or runner's body. It's more like a heavyweight lifter. Um, and then we've got uh, youthful characters, which all have the same body. And the consistency of this is seen even in Ghibli. All of the characters in Ghibli, of they're the same age, have the exact same body. He does very, very little experimentation with that. And Ponyo, that kindergarten scene, and Ponyo and um, the boy, a leading boy, I forgot his name, they all have the same body type. And then all the adults have the same body type. If it's a heavier male, of course, there's a thicker um, kind of midriff area. And if it's a heavier female, same thing. So it's all consistency just because, uh, and then that really, the wizard, he had a very long body type, but forward crouched because he's old. There you can count them on your hand um, and you really see them when you be a little bit more attentive uh, to what you're watching. And then we, we all watch everything. There's all kinds of 
uh, experimentation out there. And the best way to actively be a watcher is what I do, is I just try to jot down really quick gestures. When I'm designing a character and I'm on my phone or on my tablet, and I'm trying to watch TV as I draw, I'm not watching TV and drawing final drafts. I'm watching TV and assessing and preserving and trying to remember as many of the gesture and character types that I see. Um, so there's some really, really fun stuff out there. Um, the other day I was watching Mr. Bean and I started sketching him, trying to like get his character to the type across. If I were to ever have designed him, how would I have ever made Mr. Bean a cartoon? And they actually did that, but um, very big wobbly head, forward crouch because he's old but very tall and slim. Very, very awkward, lots of breathing room in between the torso and the arms to make him look more like a, basically a Jack Skellington body. Um, and I didn't realize that till I sat down and I would never have compared Jack Skellington's body to Mr. Bean, but that's exactly what they did when they did the character design. Of course, he had a funny little belly and he was less, way less long than Jack Skellington, but it's exactly the same body type, very suit um, fitted uh, body type. There's only so many of them. Uh, there's only so many and they are stereotypes so you can trust these stereotypes to help you create more uh, of a strong read in your design. So right across here you made the arms very long. I would have just shrunken the arms to make her look more stubby. So I didn't get the answer. Was it male or female? Um, so I didn't get the answer. I intended to do a smith who's in love with his own reflection, but I could not draw the mirror. Uh, okay, so it is a male. <clears throat> um, it is a male or for sure, or female. Yeah, it is a male. Uh, so this is reading as female instantly. I'm seeing, I'm not sure what you intended with this, but I'm seeing a very feminine kind of like side uh, bangs over here. Or like a fringe, I'm seeing that uh, very, very feminine ponytail. So a hairstyle for a smith. So when we think smith, we instantly think old. Work with that. Um, if he's a smith that he's so he thinks he's so handsome that he's staring at himself in a mirror, um, the funny thing would be if he was just really butt ugly. That would have been a way funnier thing because if he was actually handsome, that would be really weird to give him a really handsome face on a smith stubby little body. And I know this all sounds really mean, but trust me, these are very, very strong narrative styles. Um, so if he had just a most hilarious hairline, if he had uh, like a really funny close, close set eyes, but you gave him a fem female anime eyes, like they looked very, very feminine. I thought it was a woman with a beard. Um, when you give someone a beard, you kind of hide their mouth. Uh, so we see this in the characters um, uh, from How to Train Your Dragon. So a lot of the characters that just have a beard, we don't really see their mouth. Their mouth isn't really there. They don't work too hard on um, kind of like animating the, the speech of the mouth. So they just kind of use the beard and move that around and shuffle it around to make it read. So we've talked about what makes ugly ugly and what makes beautiful beautiful. Close set eyes. Where are you? Close set eyes and... small close set eyes, large nose, and large mouth. That's typically what we're always doing. You can address this to be a little bit more pointy and mean. You can have all kinds of ways, but essentially the point is that the triangle is pointing up with small eyes, large nose, large mouth. And then for female, of course, we've got, which is this character over here, we've got large eyes, small nose, and small mouth. Um, so. This is what you did the opposite of. And it would have been a lot more funny if he had just been really hilariously ugly and it would have been one of these and he just thinks he's so handsome. And there's that narrative again. There's that narrative pressure. Um, so how do you make a character the opposite of cute? Well, you can shrink their head. You could have also made this part of his, uh, just part of his, you know, like costume or something. I'll merge that down. So his head could have been a little bit shorter, a little bit smaller, and his beard could have been way stronger. Very big beard that connected the, this body type with the shoulders could have been down there. Connected this body type over here. Nice and, and consistent. His arms are short. Short arms don't really have 
the need for an elbow. So remember that. You really want to show the elbow when the character is long and stringy. And if you're using stringy features on a short character, again, you're using uncanny features all over again. And I'm just going to shrink the whole dude down. And maybe he's got a helmet on. Maybe he's got a funny head of hair. Maybe he's technically young and he's just looking for a wife and he thinks he's hilarious and, and, and charming and, and kind of handsome. So this would have been one way I would have added this. I would have given him that really, really strong forward bend um, that we see here in this Wolfman scientist, which is really funny because that's one of my favorite ones here. It's like a wolf man, but he's a scientist as well. And then, of course, he could have added his, his features in. Less circular head, so more square to show that he's a brute. And then um, the breathing room for, so let's go into liquefy, um, is, is nice, but the belt is a little bit too low. It's making him feel like his body is really long. So if he was a big, stubby, kind of like... <clears throat> like a you know smith or something his his body would have been a little bit more funny just like that um hairstyle okay i can't think of one right now it could be the funniest thing um it could be that he's got a hat on or it could be that he's a chef who thinks he's amazing uh you could give him you know like a balding sides right over here you can just make him bigger to fit within your template because this is the intended height but make sure you're compensating by elongating him that you're compensating and fixing the width as well. Okay. So I'm moving this down. And you see how useful it is to keep these intact, to keep these on. Uh, so always design with them on and that's pretty much how you're going to ensure that you have all this successful read. So from a distance, he really does feel like he's just this hilarious guy. Um, so he has to be, one section always has to be heaviest. That's another rule so that you guys should write that down. Uh, when you have one section that's heavy, uh, you have to make sure no other section can test with that or else it'll merge together and mold together. And it'll be funny in, from a distant read. So if you want him to have the legs he has over here, then you can give him this uh, short, stubby leg. But you got to just make sure it doesn't feel stringy, so I would extend the skirt of his apron down. And then, of course, there's the danger of him re feeling like he's like a, like the mama figure or mother goose body, which is a curvy body but big. So we want to make it triangular at the top and still move down. And that's how kind of you keep the, the, the character intact, but you can keep age, body type, and gender intact as well. Okay, so you have to find a middle ground. You have to find something in the middle that feels right. You have to find something in the middle that um, is following the rules but also allowing you to explore just a little bit more. I feel like this, uh, now that I look at it again, this could have been shrunken just a little bit more. She is not She is a priest. She's not a temptress. She's not supposed to be some sort of Jessica Rabbit character. Uh, where her curves are severely exaggerated for the for the purpose of the story. She does this whole monologue dance uh, number, and she has to be extremely curvy to fulfill that role in the story. But since she's just a beautiful, kind of like possibly even old female priest or, or wizard or something, sorceress, then you have to make sure this is all intact as well, that you're not over-feminizing. Uh, this character looks like they're completely out of a new story. This character looks like they should be the same height as this character. So when you have characters of equal head size, you're pretty much using that whole chibi, large head, um, small body system. Um, they should all be the same size because this is how you get something to be a little bit uncanny. So make sure that you're constantly keeping characters together. This one, I felt like you were following the rules a little too closely. Um, so you could have just... Um, worked with that whole fish person but this one I saw more as a like an old person kind of with their legs together and feel free to create breathing space like in between so right here like in between and within the shapes so you could have made a character standing just like that uh, their arm could have been hanging just like that and I'm just gonna work with the um, 
the dolphin that you have. Uh, this is nice right here. I like what you did here, but this little added piece is contesting with the fin, as you can see. So you can shrink that. And have a little bit more of something like that. This is feeling a little bit more intriguing. Breathing room is intact, and the character looks like... I guess we're just building something. I'm not sure what the character's intention is, but we're building something along um, this. I'm going to add the mirror to see if the mirror looks ridiculous. No, it looks fine. And then this is where we would kind of just mess around and start detailing shapes. And it's more fun if you work at all the characters at the same time, because you're keeping everything as if you're, you know, you're designing characters with the same drawing attitude as well. If you design them all in separate days and start them all in separate days, you're a different artist across the week. I'm not this, I'm never the same artist in the, twice in the same week. Um, so when I try to draw all at the same time, I'm just thinking about tropes. I'm not even thinking about detail and facial detail. The face, no matter what it, it's ever going to be, has to be within these restrictions anyway. Am I going to draw a face that's, you know, this big? It's going to just hang around outside of the image. So again, always make sure you have the body type down and then continue with the details later, which is why it's nice and what makes it easy um, uh, when we're just drawing all the characters at the same time with the, that same zoomed out attitude and we're getting so much more of a clear read each time. Um, so that's some of my thoughts for this piece. So you can correct them if you want and go back to them. So some of the ones that I would request you retry, I think these are your strongest ones. And I would, I would attempt a, a retry for this. If you have to keep this character, if you're enjoying this character, um, then uh, I would shrink her down to be this size and see what you can do. So shrink this whole template down. And you can lengthen these templates, move them around. They're not very specific or set in stone, but they do have a variety in weight distribution. Low heavy, top heavy, low middle heavy, uh, middle heavy, and then top heavy. Okay, so I'm just saving that. Desktop save. Okay, let's look at another one. Did I just close one? <clears throat> I'm going to look at this one. Um, so... Okay, there we go, and oh no, I should have saved the, dang it, now I'm going to have to do this all over again, that's fine. Um, okay, I'll just do it this way. <laughs> that's okay, so do you have any questions, Julia, about all of the changes we've made today? So one of the things that can't change is your narration. You can't go back and rewrite a character. I mean, uh, I mean, obviously writers do this. They go back and rewrite characters just to edit them because there's a change that could have been made later. Nothing is ever set in stone, but it's still, um, uh, you know, not a, not a good thing. They go have to go back and rewrite just to make up for your lack of skill. That's not. That's never a good thing. Um, so what you can do always is just continue in this path and find things you can change. You can't change the writing. You can somehow very, very, like very little change the template you intended. Um, you know, first set of templates. Maybe your art director is giving you these templates. Maybe your employer is giving you these templates. Again, those things might not always be changeable. And the things you can change is your interpretation and the creative interpretation that you come with. Um, so this is creative pressure. This is character design. This is 100% creative pressure. But you can fragment the creative pressure into different stages. And this template system has always been one really great way. So I may have changed your character around, but he still was a smith. She still was a very long, tall priestess. Um, the changes we made were just removing the uncanniness. Um, so that, that's really the biggest thing. So we're getting rid of the uncanniness. <clears throat> assignment makes a lot more sense now. You're very welcome. I didn't want to, I couldn't write all this, of course, in the brief, the homework brief, so I had to just wait till our meet. Um, I totally missed the point about the characters belonging to the same story. Thank you very much for the tips. I definitely want to try and change them. Yeah, I'll change them. Everything that I assign um, in our Patreon apprentice assignments is portfolio worthy. So all of these are portfolio pieces. I never assign like random stuff, like one sword. Um, I would assign a whole setup of different ancient weapons, and I'm not really assigning um, like specific niches like fantasy art all the time. You can interpret these to be all kinds of characters, more modern characters, uh, stuff that you could be, you know, for some hired for some 
funny little animated commercial for an insurance company and you're being you're, you're assigned to design different like a whole family um, and that's a character design so there's so many ways to apply this um, the, the assignments are always very open but very portfolio friendly okay so I'm going to take a look at these I'm just going to have a drink of water be right back Okay, um, so I, I love what you did with this one. I made it bottom heavy, kept everything intact. I think the arm is, uh, the hand is on the wrong, the wrong way. Uh, some of these you kept the uh, uh, personality and like an emotion with them. So that kind of helped you get across. I like how you saw the big rounded head and the single eye. Um, emotion wasn't necessary, but it's definitely helping you how you saw the head being so low on the torso and you saw that as a, an angry person kind of tensed up with their head lower than their body. I love that. I love how you read that. Um, so a lot of you are, and it's not really born with it, but some people find it much easier to, uh, see things in random shapes than others. Some people are just visual thinkers like that. So if I were to look at, you know that weird stucco ceiling stuff they put on the top of your ceiling? Sometimes I see characters in those and that really helps me design. So a lot of you will have to fight your inability to see characters in random, or see stuff in random designs, random patterns. So for me, I can see a character design in like a weird shape of a cloud. So I'm looking at a cloud, I see a whole character. So some people don't have that thinking pattern. Some people don't think like that. Um, so this kind of challenge is actually very difficult because it's hard for you to interpret what you're seeing. Um, but uh, some find it very easy and those are the ones that thrive. So uh, I'm not sure what exercises other than this specific exercise, other than doing it, is going to help you see shapes better and see characters in random shapes better. Uh, but when you do that, you are the type of artist that always makes an intriguing a character. You're never at a loss for creativity. You're never at a loss for intrigue and funny, um, uh, unusual delivery of the same old character, but you have some really cool new twist to them. And that all comes from your ability to uh, just see the random, see, see, see purpose in the random. So that was a very, very good addition here. I really like that. Though I don't want you to depend on emotion to continue the character unless the character is constantly angry. Um, unless their design is just a constantly angry, uh, like angry bird, which is really cute. Um, but also angry kind of, I think a stewardess or a bank teller. I'm not sure. The hat really gives off, throws me off. So if you got rid of the hat, it should look like some sort of business leader or something like that. This is good. We did something here. We enlarged the arms uh, and lengthened the arms. So this character has very long arms, but as you can see, he's got no, he's got no neckline. But you have a neckline here, and so what that did is I'm lost. Where are you? What that did is we have a neck here, and so we have a neck. We have long arms, but a very stubby body, large head. Mm, things are starting to look a little bit uncanny. Um, they're waiters at a restaurant. Oh, okay, okay. Um, interesting, interesting. Uh, oh, monster restaurant. That's one so stupid. I, don't, I never read this stuff. Um, so what I would do to, to kind of make this feel a little bit more funny is I would shorten his arms. It feels feel like he's not doing anything with his arms. So if he's a chef, he's constantly busy. I've never seen a happy chef in my entire life. Any, any kind of design anywhere, I've never seen a happy chef. Um, so a bull is always seen as something that's angry. Um, so continue with that. It may seem boring to you, but at the same time, when was the last time we saw a bull chef? Um, so you have to be creative in one aspect, tops two, but you can't be creative in every single aspect and, and give us something completely new. That's when we get a character that we've never seen before. So the audience um, can be very, very overwhelmed when you, when you try to be new in too many ways. Um, so, just an angry, snobby chef. Um, so I would have actually made him look a little bit more angry by making his jawline, the top of his snout, 
not align with the bottom of the snout to make him look a little bit more kind of like tough. That would have been a little bit more interesting. And then you've got his smaller eyes, or maybe eyes that are so small, like he's, oops, that's not right. <laughs> like he's a little bit more angry. And then you have that constant, you know, grouchiness. Um, so that could have been nice, especially now that it matches with his angry arms, but the angry arms are still long, so we still have to go back down and uh, get rid of the neck. So the neck has to go, because when we're talking a bull, like let's look at a picture of a bull. They don't, they don't really have a neck, do they? I mean, they're not an animal that we can say we see a neck. Bull um, farm. I hope it doesn't give me like weird pictures. <clears throat> so when we're seeing one facing us, you see how we have their little hump at the top. They're not really, um, they don't really have a neck. They're not, a, they're not an animal with a neck. Uh, the bull cop from Zootopia, but the bull cop from Zootopia was athletic. He had to be mixed with the Olympian athletic body type. Um, and does he really have like a full on neck? Um, so what's his name? Bull Cop Zootopia. Um, yeah, he still has, he has, it's hard to see, it's hard to say that he has a neck because he has, if we follow the gesture line up, it goes above his jawline. So his jawline is still very much beneath, whereas yours was um, a little bit above. See how the jawline is above your line and it finishes off. His gesture line kept going us up so that we saw it in our eyes. We saw it as, you know, beneath. So he still was crouching a little bit. So these animals, all of the animals that are big, slow animals don't have necks. So that's something you can depend on that you never have to deal with. He doesn't have a neck at all. So you never have to deal with being too creative. You can, I'm, I'm scared to, zo to, to scroll any lower with Zootopia. <laughs> It's like friggin' free feeding frenzy um, for some art niches. Uh, but um, that's one of the tropes that you can always depend on as never failing you, that will never fail you. So if you trust that the, the neckline should be low, and then I'll go into the previous layer. Wait a second. I'll go into the previous layer and then use liquify to raise the shoulder line. It'll kind of complete the body type. So look at how much variety you guys had with your, you know, it's the stories that you added on the shapes, but the templates are all still the same. So I'm just going to lower this dude a little bit and then just get the black. And then you see how now when we get rid of the arms, we can't really have um, Zootopia cup. Bull. Let's see his arm length. Um, so, all right, so are they fat and long? He has definitely has the Achilles body type, so he's allowed that, which is a body type we're seeing over and over and over again with all of the all of the more athletic characters. And then when the character gets to be a little bit more tubby and stubby, the arms are very short and fat. And you can have an arm that looks like it's proportionately long enough. So this is where the trouble comes in, but it's not fat enough. The arm that we're seeing the width over here, at least from this perspective, it's just not big enough. So you have to find another way to interpret the arms. What I do is I, everything has an elbow for on forearm and an upper arm. But the way you connect them can be a little bit more like this. And this would be, you know, the arm, the hand. This would be the wrist. This would be a little indication here for the elbow. And for the same, with the same template, I am, um, come over here. I can draw a very thin arm that's more long. This is the exact same template. One of these is reading as a little bit more athletic and one of them is reading as more tubby, but this is the exact same template. Adding width alone will provide you with that extra, um, you know, to match the body types. So in his, when he's crossing his arms, they did a very strategic thing, which is hide the hands. 
his little hands would have looked so hilarious. Like, look, look at his little feet. He's tiny. Because they have to be. They're exaggerating the body type. Um, very big triangle. But if they had kept his hands visible in this type, it would have looked hilarious beside his head because everything was big, 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 and then everything shrinks back down. So they hid his hands on purpose and they th thickened his arms and forearms on purpose. This thickness is the same as this thickness. So that's what I would tell you to look out for. Whenever you're doing arm length in your ch look at this arm length is fine because he's a long, stringy character. Um, hers is fine because it's just not really necessary for us to um, use anything outside of the normal human proportion when we're talking about characters that are supposed to be pretty and proportionate. Um, this guy's arms seem fine because he's more of a triangular body type. But this guy's a full-on square, um, and uh, this, the longer arms have really thrown him off. So I would have done something a little bit more burly and top-heavy like that. Um, and then completely just uh, gotten rid of some of this. And then I would have started off with these shapes and then just dressed it up like that. Okay, so there's a, a character design is there's a lot of mathematics in it and there's a lot of thinking behind it and a lot of people just think, oh yeah, they just go in and draw something interesting and uh, hopefully it looks okay. It's never, it's never that easy. I'll just probably give him a little anchor. Is that how an anchor looks? And then probably like a ripped up sleeve. He just looks like a bad guy. Not a bad guy, but like a tough guy. And he's got his hilarious, I don't know where I've seen this, but it's like a very big character, like a rhino. And like a tiny little apron. Oh, Kung Fu Panda. Um, Kung Fu Panda, he has like, he's like a massive character, but he's got the tiniest little apron, which is so funny, and it can hardly tie up around him, and his legs end all the way over here, but his, <laughs> his apron, is... I love the designs in Kung Fu Panda, all of them, they're the best, um, but yeah, you could give him a tiny little apron just there, continue the width of his body type, and, um, just like we have in the cop, short little tiny legs. Just like that. And you could have given them some standing gestures. That would have really helped. So we kept the arms the same, but we thickened these and we hid the hands, just like they did here, to continue that large and fit. So imagine if we were to have this character, what would have been the template uh, shapes they would have used. So let's try to do that over here and then finish off with the character designs. So if we had this dude... Oh, shoot. I could have just taking a picture of it. <clears throat> so we'll lower down his opacity and um, there we go. Just gonna put a big old shape in front of him. Lower down. Okay, so if we were to give him specific shapes, oops, and we were to uh, kind of figure out what they did, so a circle would have been I don't know, where are you? Um, where do you decide on the style? There we go. So this would have been one initial shape. This would have been one initial. These are just circles that I'm using, but look at how basically triangular or like a trapezoid, and then he's got these two extra pieces. So this would have been just like that. But, you know, that the common artist would have just seen something very basic, probably a girl with pigtails, Probably a silly little alien, um, probably some other really basic animal, um, but there's so much you can do with the most basic shape setup. So for the other part, um, uh, let me leave those in actually. I would have used like a square for like the rest over here and uh, a, probably a larger square like that and a larger square like that but I'm only occupying some of it. So they're general guidelines. They're general, they're not really supposed to be the actual character itself. And that's why they're so open to interpretation. But the, from a far away look, from, from like the, a distance, this is a basic Achilles body type. You've got the large triangular Olympian, top heavy, and then you've got the lower pieces. But he is a tank, technically. He's not some sort of parkour, lightweight, 
assassin. He's a big, heavy, tanky character. They're working off the animals. And as you can see here, you see how we've used the circles as gesture line guides instead of the actual mass? Um, you're still creating mass. You're still drawing a circle. This is still mass in his original design. His horns are still reading as a sphere, but pointy and gesturally at the same time. Um, so uh, always, they're, oh, they're always find any character. If you're having trouble seeing the consistency in these tropes, choose all your favorite characters and do this exercise on them. Um, do the circles on them and you'll see that, um, in fact, it's just all the same basic old stuff that's always been there. And you have to go back and use these exact templates again yourself. Um, so I think I've, I've covered everything I wanted to cover with this. Um, a couple things to keep in mind is head shape. So if you're drawing a head shape, um, the head shape is a great way to, it's like a gauge for ages. And so all ages of the characters of the same age have the same head shape. So children have a specific large head shape. Um, 30s and 20s kind of have the same head shape and older characters have the same head shape and size. Um, so that's one really great way if you're designing all your characters beside each other to keep them consistent. Uh, that's just one big tip from me. Do you guys have any questions at all from all of this? I'd love to see some response homework. Um, if you guys want to try this design again, I know that the character design, you're gonna, obviously going to have a larger due date than the uh, community does. Theirs is due on the 8th. Uh, but you guys is doing the end of uh, February, so you'll have time to design your champion. You'll have a lot more free reign uh, with the champion that you're designing. Of course, it's still a bow. It's still a. It's still like a, an archer, but you get to design a little bit more with a little bit more freedom, um, and it's all full color, full render. Uh, but if you want to and create some response homework, I'd love to see how you guys go back and um, uh, just apply all of these rules and apply all of this stuff um, to your designs. Yeah, good, good. I'd like to see that. Um, any questions at all? You guys can feel free to use the mic. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to set up this. Okay, so thank you. It's a tiny little exercise, but there's just so much involved in it. So um, there's no one thing that, that is this easy in art, especially when designing people and designing characters, building worlds. This takes a lot of planning and a lot of thinking. So this was one, and this was another one. You guys did amazing. I'm not sure if there's much I need to cover. I'm gonna look over the homework submission uh, text channel again. So I got that, I got that. <clears throat> Yeah, so the video that I gave you guys to watch was my recent trend line video and how I basically in it talk about how important it is to trace um, so that you can have a better, a different um, stage with which you interact with your reference. Interacting with your reference is a new environment. So it's like you've always looked at the same shape in the same perspective, always. Imagine there's a big architectural shape in the park and you've always walked down the same path and you've always seen that big architectural statue, um, the thingy, artistic statue thing, um, from the same perspective all the time. You can probably draw it really, really well if you were to remember it from that angle. You've always looked at it in that angle. But along with rotation, when rotation comes along and your, your character design, I mean, your photo reference for this month is gonna be a three quarter view suddenly when you're taking a new path along the park and you see the object from behind there's a whole aspect to it you probably never understood it could, it could have been a lot more flat than you understood it to be or originally saw it to be a lot more thick a lot more uh, the texture could have been different zoomed in than zoomed back zoomed out and walking away from it um, so this is what tracing is it, it changes the way you interact with your reference it gives you a whole new um, way of interrupting those negative inhibiting habits that you might have these habits might be the large eyes so your interpretation for some reason has even larger eyes in the reference you've added a thicker water line and I think your pupil is actually a lot larger the nose you read wonderfully the mouth you read wonderfully uh, but there is a sense of cuteness here and it comes from the closeness of the mouth to the nose your nose mouth ratio is actually a lot smaller um, than in the reference. His is actually delayed a little bit. The head shape, you got it right. The um, muscular structure here, you got it right. 
Um, so the shape of the eyebrows is one really massive thing I see in students. They don't know how to get the shape of the eyebrows down, especially for a male character. So he's a little bit effeminate. His face is very beautiful. Pluck his eyebrows and have him off like steroids for a year and look like a woman. Um, because it's just, I've seen this carrot face type so many times, it's very, very feminine. So I kind of threw this hardball at you guys to see what you guys interpret, and it did enable a lot of your cutifying tendencies. Um, but a lot of you just had it, um, interpreted it really, really well. So I don't think I have any more of these submissions. So some of you actually captured the expression, which is more of a squinted eye, partial smile. Um, this one actually captured the eye size very well and the focus in the eyes. Uh, and the focus in the eyes here is a little bit lost. The eyes feel look a little bit off. But this is all still very, very advanced stuff. It all looks very, very wonderful. Hopefully the um, three-quarter view that I assign you guys very soon um, will kind of show me exactly how well or how consistent you <laughs> how consistent your success is. And maybe we'll find that some of those who uh, thrived from front view uh, suddenly and through quarter view, all the mistakes are visible. Um, so sometimes I like to assign a double like portrait homework, one without reference that you do first and one with reference that you do after. The reason why I assign the one without reference with reference after is that so that you know we're not uh, answering the questions for you. A photo reference answers all the questions for you. You're not thinking. You don't have to remember that the light is top. You do, but you, it's obviously answered for you. It tells you where the shadows are. No reference portrait work, portrait work is what you do when you're um, uh, well into your reference work. You understand that the light needs to constantly be paid attention to, asking where the direction of a light source is. Um, and when you're painting without reference, there's a lot more for you to monitor. You're responsible for a lot more. And no reference to quarter view is when it's a completely different artist. The results I get are completely different. And that's where we find all, all our mistakes. Not only do you have to rotate, but you have to preserve symmetry, you have to preserve likeness, and you have to keep in mind all the rules of form. So through quarter view, photo reference, or through quarter view, no reference, or both might be for homework. Um, considering how successful you guys are with this, I want to challenge you to be a little bit um, more attentive um, to, to just the units that are present there. And then a photo reference from front view, there's only so many units for you to be attentive to, especially if it's answering all your questions for you. But that's just my way of saying you guys did well. <laughs> that's my way of saying you guys actually did pretty good. Um, so let me see if there's any more. Good job on delaying the pupils. Um, uh, uh, Julia, very, very good job. I like seeing that. I'm not sure if it was because you watched my pupil video, or should I say rant, but um, uh, I like how you delayed the pupils. It's good to delay the pupils. It's excellent practice, especially for growing students. I think your texture work is a little bit, um, you're, you're, you're bringing in texture and you're getting away with it because it's early on in your reference. But it shows. It shows in your final piece how much texture, unnecessary texture you had, and it shows up as a very specific word, which is blotchy. Um, blotchy is what happens when you have just floating random stuff here that you think you blended away, but from a distance, there it is just hanging out um, kind of there. Um, the shadows, the shadow clusters that I see, like the shadow neighborhoods that I see, um, seem to be interrupted quite a bit. Um, so this is all just perfectionism, of course. Uh, but I, I do think the way you blend needs a little bit more edge work. Just over here under the eye, just on the lower eyelid area, there is a massive edge for the lower eyelid and an edge between the nose size, um, to the sides of the nose and the, and the front facing sides of the cheek. You have no edge work there. Um, so it might seem like, oh, it's just rough. It's just early rough work. This is just me um, kind of just messing about creating a, a, a stage for my paint eventually to develop and, de uh, develop and evolve, but it's really not. It's actually inhibiting your um, texture and you're actually setting yourself up for the a misread. So what are some textures that are blotchy? Leather is blotchy, latex is blotchy because it's reflecting so many things nearby. Skin is actually very matte, and this guy doesn't seem like he has any oily patches, anything like that, and 
It's the overblending that can lead to a misread in the skin texture. So this is here with something that you had as reference. So you didn't have to assign the light and design the character and preserve the gender and preserve the age. Imagine if you had to do all of that and blend. You have to block. Blocking is, the benefit of it is that you have a mid-tone that goes on as long as the plane does. Where have we seen this before? In geometries, in geometric studies. So when we continue one value for a long enough period, we understand that this entire period, this entire section, all faced in the same direction as it would in a low poly, a sorrow type bust. So the nose from here to here and from here to here is all essentially the same value. But you squint your eyes, everybody just squint your eyes a little bit. You can see a line right here and a line right here, a line right here. These are all edges and you're not having any of these edges um, kind of respected in your work. And so you have values that are traveling way too long and you no longer have your mid-tone geometry intact because you've made it look like he's actually a stuffed animal that doesn't really have edges because he has no spinal structure inside. We do have skeletal structure that defines when skin folds, how long skin goes before changing direction. And the best thing to remember when you have blotchy, over-textured work like this, and I'm gonna take a look and see if you actually submitted anything else so I can see if you have this anywhere else in your uh, gallery, but um, when you, when you have blotchiness like this, it's a sign of um, just a crutch. It's something that you're using because you don't know how to do something else and you're overdoing it because of an in-canvas in anxiety. Um, so this excessive textureness, keep an eye out for it. It is one specific small thing, but I can't imagine how it might affect you when we're dealing with recorder view. You're probably gonna texture even more and you're gonna depend on it even more. Um, but whatever you guys did, uh, the trend line video that you watched, uh, keep doing that. It's an excellent way to preserve likeness. And here's the good news. The more you use trend lines now, the less you'll need them later because you will automatically see trend lines in your mind. You'll instantly want to start drawing because they're just right there in front of you. You won't miss them anymore. You won't actually have to do the, le the trend line um, uh, stage anymore. You can skip it because of how many times you've done it. So for the upcoming homework, just imagine it like homework assigned in January, you still have to apply all you learned to the homework assigned in April. So in April, if I'm assigning you a three quarter view color character design portrait, you still have to use trend lines then too. So imagine it's gonna be like a whole year or however long you stay with me of trend lines. You're gonna be a beast at getting all of the likeness intact. You're gonna actually never, likeness is never gonna leave you because you're always gonna look for the symmetry line, vertical line, trend lines, downturn, characterization in the eyes, thickness of the nose um, as related to the, to the width of the eyes from each other, distance between the nose and the mouth, that's where we get likeness. And when I say likeness, I mean how similar, is it the same person as the person in the reference? And this is important when you're working with um, customers who are giving you a photo for you to work with or character design and you built a mood board and you said, I really like this actress, I want to borrow, borrow from her features. That's how you use trend lines. So it's one big learning tool and design tool. So any questions at all from anyone? Anyone who had anything that was particularly difficult for them to do or confusing? Anyone to report anything weird? Um, in their process, or maybe they learn something. Um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. For mine, um, I I think I lost the power of the gaze. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't under I don't understand what um, went wrong there. Um, so your gaze is actually not bad at all. I think um, that the eyes you had over here, uh, this one is just a little bit smaller, but this one is actually a little bit more squinted, but I just think you made it a bit more squinted. Um, the reason why your gaze might be missing is maybe the pupil isn't there. Also, um, the whites of the eyes are just a little bit fuzzy, but in all honesty, I don't think you had a major problem with the gaze, though to you it might have been a major problem. Uh, from the way you saw it. So I'm just shrinking it so that we see it from more of a distance. 
um, I don't have to enlarge it for me to get a read. Do you know what I mean? That's how it's, that's how you know it passed. Oh. Um, so I, I don't see a problem with the gaze so much. It's just maybe the completion level. Um, you could probably benefit from a higher completion level just around the eyes. What you've done with the mouth and the nose, you can leave it there exactly. Um, it's just the eyes that need a bit more completion. So texture completion around the eyebrows, eye detail around the eye sockets, um, radial shading around the eye socket lids into the eye socket line, uh, detail around the, the iris, making sure the iris is nice and sharp as you see on the reference. Uh, the illusion of texture and the edge work around the lash line and the lower eyelid. Um, so this is really what I would have loved to see a little bit more of. Um, you can get away with an under-rendered lip all day and maybe a half unrendered lip of a no, um, sorry, unrendered nose, but the eyes you really can't get away with. So it feels incomplete, if anything, and that might be what you're getting off because the gaze, you're expecting so much out of the eyes because the eyes are a focal point. That might have been what you were sensing. Um, yeah, I, th I think yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah. So if you just finish it off, complete it, um, clear up the, the the top half there, and make sure that it's not leading the eyes of the viewer away from the canvas. Uh, apply some texture, and this will be an excellent portfolio piece for you to have. Um, it's an excellent interpretation of the bone structure. I think the symmetry is intact. Um, but yeah, I think you're just you have like an inner desire to complete the eyes and um, just, just follow that instinct and stop when you think it's done. Stop when you no longer have that kind of lingering feeling. That's how I know when to stop drawing. Uh, when I know that, even though I know the lips, I spent like 30 minutes on them, for some reason the painting feels finished. Um, so I can show you which of these actually, if we were to just assess them, I can show you which of these, if we were to hide, some of these pieces. So this piece is a recent piece of mine. I'm going to get a sticky and hide the eyes for you. You guys can see how much your teacher cheated. Just look at how under 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 those lips are. But you get away with it because if you continue completion here, this is all you really need. So compare this amount of contrast to this amount of contrast. It's like less than half almost. It's almost completely gone. You get to do that in a portrait because when we're meeting someone, when we're designing a portrait, we're painting it as if the person is face to face with us. We're not using a camera. A camera sees any of everything. Unfortunately, our references are camera, um, our photographs. So you get away with that um, only with, if it's a photograph but uh, not one so just take a look at this one i'm not particularly proud of this one but just take a look at the lips this is really elementary early, early initial brush strokes and then compare it with the texture of the eyes and then we go back to this one where are you eyes and eye texture and then the lips very very under rendered and very underdeveloped compared so this is a very, very big um, detail for you to keep. This creep right here, <laughs> I don't know why I ever drew this. So eye texture, eye contrast, and then just comparing it to the lips. It just looks so dorky and stupid and under-rendered. And it just looks like, I, it looks like I'm, I've never drawn before. And that's okay because we get away with it. You don't have to render every single part, but the one thing that has to always be prioritized is, are the eyes. Okay, so for this one, um, uh, what we are kind of missing is more of the likeness in the eyebrows. So the eyebrows, if I were to draw the trend lines on the eyebrows, which I hope you did, um, because this is pretty much what we're trying to teach you here today is to get likeness and the kind of specific characters, just just what it is that makes this character that, that, that so unique is... This is one trend line, and this is one trend line, and this is one trend line. So this shape has to be there in the eyebrows for it to work. And then you've got the sparse start, and then you've got these to guide your brush stroke. So this is what I mean by trend lines. When we're tracing, that's not what I'm intending with a trace. This is a trend line right here. 
another trend line, and that tells you, hey, the eyes are actually pretty close together. Yeah, males do have eyes that are closer together, even if they're large. Male eyes do tend to be close to each other, and, and you know, just looking at the width of the nose, the distance of the mouth, if we were to assess it between the cupid's bow end and the tip of the nose, um, you can just try to see what that relationship, oh shit, what that relationship is for the width of the, of the nose bridge. It's exactly identical. Um, and then you're adding these extra two, which are the, actually the lengths of the nostrils. So this is aligned with this, and this is all nostril from here to the inside of the eye. This is how you get likeness. These are what I, this is what I mean by trend line. Trend lines are measurement tools so that write that down. And trend lines are ways to preserve the character. Um, and when you're working with more than one reference, you're going to kind of have to find yourself. You can't trace every single reference. What I do is I use at least like three references per drawing that I do. Um, and I can't just sit there all day finding trend lines. So because I've done them so many times, because I've taught them so many times, I, you can't skip this because one day you're going to be working with more than one reference and to draw trend lines will probably slow you down. So do them as much as you can now on these singular pieces before it gets really difficult and you have three quarter view trend lines which is way more measurement, way more um, rotation, volume is expected out of you. So um, what you think eyebrows look like is not enough. Um, it's what they actually look like. Yes, it's a bit of you know, a stunt for your creativity, but you're a student and everything's in grayscale. There's no creativity expected out of you, especially for a study, especially for the four reference study. You're just applying what you're, what you're seeing in the reference. One day you're going to design a character. These eyebrows are going to be perfect for them. And because you used your trend lines and analyzed them so intimately, you're going to have them and it's like stamped and engraved in your brain. You're not going to be able to let go of that and you're not going to forget and you're going to have so much more facial variety and that's the final benefit of trend lines. So the first two were finding the characterization, then there's measurement, and then there's more variety in the faces that you draw. So these are three amazing um, qualities of vir virtues I guess a, a, an artist can have. They have great facial variety, they know how to copy a reference and know what to keep and know what to get rid of, and their measurements and their uh, proportions are flawless all because you traced a little bit every single time you did one so when you don't trace you miss out on likeness on proportion this eye is way lower than this eye um, the lips were very well done surprisingly I think you always do really really well with lips uh, Link um, but um, I feel like you're missing some of the major shadows around the nose um, some of these cluster shadows here could have been a little bit let me open this up um, nope that's not the one so the, the shadow under the nose, this big region of shadow down here. Um, I think you missed out on the actual um, kind of skin type. He's actually pretty light. And uh, the eye size and the pupil size. So his pupil size is just unusually large. Um, and again, I'm just throwing you guys off here with the genders. Um, and I'll give you less of a hardball next time gender-wise, but I will give you a very difficult um, kind of like uh, either male or female. Male is harder in three-quarter view. Um, sorry, female is harder in three-quarter view compared to male uh, because male tends to be a little bit more structured, so it's very easy to draw polygon rotated than it is to draw a big blob rotated. But I will give you guys something a little bit easier than last time, but the pupils are a little bit off considering your reference had such large pupils. And they do happen, as you can see, they do happen. Um, they're better on females, of course, if you're a designer, but if you're drawing a love interest, character step, character design, this is where it all comes together. This is where it all matters, um, that you're preserving all of this characterization and the stuff, the tools that you need later. I'm designing a, um, a, a really kind but very burly and big um, tank love interest, Romeo Frey very simple love story but it has an uh, overarching monster hunter narrative and I'm being assigned for it and I'm part of a studio what do I do well you call on these big eyes you call on the eyebrows probably use another character's lower half um, and then you continue with the rest of the body that the, the neck is so large he's probably doesn't have a very large neck either very long neck because he's so built 
um, and then you have this now for you to use later. Um, so use your trend lines, whatever. And as you can see, this is a common theme in all my all my assignments. Uh, the templates for the character design and the trend lines. This is all planning. And in my book that I'm writing right now, which I will give you guys um, copies of very very soon for you to read over. Um, just patrons only, obviously. Uh, but um, I talk a lot about planning. Probably the largest chapter in my book is about planning. Um, and how important it is to answer as many questions. There will still be questions brought in when you render. You will still want to go back and rewrite just so you could fix the mistake you know you can't work around. But planning is the common theme here. And if you're not planning, you're not answering questions but when you, when it's convenient to. Um, you're answering them, you're, you're, you're having, you're asking yourself these questions and you have to answer them when it's inconvenient. Uh, at the time when you're rendering, when you're worried about your edges and your value sharing, when you're worried about whether or not you use too much contrast. These are enough questions to think about. Um, so planning is the most important thing. I hope you guys use it. It'll sharpen your portfolios. It'll answer all the questions about your workflow problems. If you find yourself really slow and it takes you two weeks to draw something, some of those questions could have been answered when you did your trend line. Some of those questions could have been answered when you um, asked yourself, is the costume really reflecting the character? Is the character's silhouette being interrupted by the costume? Why does this character look like a big potato in a, in a, in a, in a landscape? Um, why does it look like a potato? And that's, and I've seen potato characters. I've seen some character designs from students. It just looks like a potato with legs and a sword. And that's because they didn't think about leg breathing room, arm breathing room, and you can do all of that with your character design template. Um, so a lot of these assignments are gonna be simple, but the fundamentals behind them are so complicated they like need a two hour lecture um, just, to, just to assess. So thank you all for doing your homework. Um, that's a very big thing. I wouldn't be here um, if you guys didn't do your homework. Um, but uh, I do want you guys to kind of take this um, as if it's homework from school. So if you haven't completed it, please make sure that you are. If you need extensions, I can always extend. Um, but just because we're running on a month by month Patreon thing, but I can always extend de uh, deadlines if you guys feel comfortable with like a longer deadline. Um, but um, any questions at all regarding today's class, it's your time to ask questions now um, and uh, kind of just discuss what we covered. Any questions about anything that I talked about, um, maybe not clearly enough. So I'm just going to scroll down and then I'm going to take a look at these portfolio pieces handed in. <clears throat> so I have to make sure I know who I'm talking to. And um, so this one was, oh, okay, I couldn't get the brows right and I kept reworking them over and over. Um, yeah, it's sometimes really good to find the extremes. So what I do when I can't get the brows right, and it's just so simple, one day it just popped in my head, is what's the highest point of the eyebrow and what's the lowest point? And I found that and I did that through the start, middle and end of the eyebrow. If you do that, you really can't ever get snuck up on by an eyebrow. This is a very specific type of eyebrow too. It's very thick, but also wispy. And it's got a lot of little uh, breathing room in, in between all of the little sections and it's got a sharp finish. So it's round and sharp. This one was a bit of a hard ball. Um, but if you assess where's the highest and lowest here, highest and lowest here and here, and fill in the lines, draw your trend lines, you really can't, can't you really can't get over, um, like you know, have it get away from you. It'll, it'll, you'll be able to see it right away. <clears throat> um, so your portrait, you felt like it looked a little bit plasticky. Um, so let me ask, find yours, Kira. Homework submission. <clears throat> uh, plasticky. I think it's because of that tech, uh, that that amount of contrast he had around the eyes. He uh, remember when I spoke about the mid tone lasting long enough. Your shadows for your nose actually went right into the cheeks, and then your your contrast went a little bit higher. Patches of highlight basically means plastic. So if you have just sudden out of nowhere blotches of highlight. Um, so let me open it up. If you have sudden blotches of highlight and his temple, look how far your temple goes. Your far, temple goes above his middle line of his eye brow, but his is actually, there's like an actual line right here. He's so bulky. 
and this continues for a long enough time and when um, so I'm gonna move my brush only when the highlights start so and then we go up and then we go back down so this is a very very gradual spike and then a sudden presence but yours kind of does this very unevenly and then plop all the way back down that's why it looked like plastic because you had too many ups and downs so you read that look at the shadow here how far it extends outward and then you have this really really defined water line that's very white uh, all of that works together to create that blotchy feeling and that plasticky feeling um, <clears throat> uh, yeah all the completion between the eyes and the lips I couldn't get the gaze right making it uncanny mouth isn't right either um, so let me find yours okay the gaze isn't yeah your gaze was a little bit off um, it was a little bit looking down the way to get a gaze right is to first zoom out, don't draw the pupils or the iris, and then use a hard round brush on Photoshop, and from a distance, apply, using a you know a brush tool, or I mean, sorry, just clicking, apply the pupil. Why? I, I do this, and I do this because a gaze can't be assessed zoomed in. When you zoom in, what do you, you know, what do you say, what do you, what do you have as a form of reference? So when you're um, it's, 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 it's hard to tell unless you're zoomed out whether or not the gaze is right and if the gaze is low on the so you have the two here if the gaze is low it looks like the character is looking down but if the gaze is kind of a little bit higher he looks like he's looking forward but that was the slightest little bit of breathing room here and it looked like the character is looking up and not just that like this so we have more space on this side than this side and then suddenly everything was looking working properly but in yours you had the opposite there were more space on the inside than the outside and then you had no breathing room under the pupil but he he does have some white under the eyes he's looking right at the camera yeah the bottom part is shaved off under the eyes but that's not because he's looking up, that's because of his squint and his eyes. So that's why we're doing the pupils uh, last and then the iris last. So that's why your gaze was just a little bit off. Um, the, the lips are completely collapsed and the nose is asymmetrical. Not that bad though. Maybe because your trend lines weren't strong enough. So I would lift this whole part upward and then um, that would have worked a little bit better. So remember that we have vertical and horizontal symmetry lines, and those are part of the trend lines. And then I'm just gonna take a look at your pieces here. Um, so you're looking for help with this piece. I think you did wonderfully, but I think you would benefit from like an extra light somewhere maybe it doesn't have to be fully black all around the image because i feel like you're losing so much i could do with like a little silhouette or something of the character just anything to help the character come through because all we're seeing right now is one entire half of the canvas completely black and that's mm -hmm. not good composition um, you want to be able to occupy some space in the distance and then complete the book cover i, I see this as a book cover so anything like a, yeah, something like this could have been more than enough. And yeah, you can still have a secondary light source in a dark room. It could have been a cave dimly lit by some hole in the cavity somewhere in the distance in the cave. But she still has a flame and she's probably someone the character met and is telling them stories or something like that. Um, so anything to complete the rest of the painting, you cannot have half the painting. And shadow the only way you can do that is if you raise the entire painting up and then continue some detail here so maybe we could see the candle maybe we could see the rest you can always do this and this is something I do a lot of if this is just a lot of black paint it's not part of the framing um, and it's a lot of this is photography so if there is something here a necklace of destiny a sword of light a candle of truth you kind of have to keep it all in there. 
um, part of the canvas, okay? So this looks like a beautiful piece. The character has close set eyes, but is a female. Looks wonderful. I think you did so well with the face. I would try to pr bring in some kind of extra, kind of elemental, um, not fantasy elemental, just anything extra, something something metallic to, to counter all of this mattified organic, something like that, uh, that okay. might interrupt the texture a little bit and bring in something interesting, maybe a sudden spark or shine of highlight from something metallic reflecting the same candle. Careful when you bring in light sources in a reference, um, in, inside your, sorry, canvas, uh, because it will become the focal point. So you have to dim a candle more than it would actually be in real life. So you might have to throw off the candle off screen or just have whatever the light source is just off screen and have all of the characters designed. So if they have a necklace, detail that because you've lost the face as the focal point, you have to pick it up somewhere or share it across. But still, nothing should be more detailed than the eyes, but can be as detailed since the eyes are so under detailed. Because a low hanging light is not the best light with which we see people. And when we're ourselves, humans, artists or not, the sun is always above us when we're talking to people and recording good, good um, exposure on faces. So we are used to recording faces from top down light, okay? But I really recommend you finish this. I recommend this new cropping. I love what you did. I'd hate to see it just thrown off. Um, I don't like turning studies into masterpieces, but sometimes they're just so well done. I encourage the student to go all out and just see what they can what they can do with it. Um, this piece here, um, your biggest problem with it is the <clears throat> is this uh, the fact that your shadow is actually not blurring properly the further it gets. Shadows don't really wrap around like wallpaper. Um, so it really just depends on your reference. I'd have to see it. If the light was top down and the sphere was casting a shadow starting from this line, that means that this shadow had to enough, had been dark enough to be molded in with this shadow here. Do you get what I'm saying? So it kind of like merges and melts together. It's not really, and then you just blend away because of course it's a circle and it's not a geometry. Eventually shadow marries into the value of whatever is there as well. So we're not actually combining values like that. See that? And also you still have to fuzz it out because the further the object gets from the light source, or the object it's casting on, or anything. So it's a relationship. You've got light source, object. I'm actually going to have to go soon. I have a student in five minutes. Um, and the object that it's casting on, so receiving object. This distance fuzzes out a shadow. This distance fuzzes out a shadow. You've also got the, char the object's characteristics. Is it like a lacy fabric, or is it a hard structure? Um, all of these affect the way cast shadows work, but still, the further the object is from either of these dudes, light source or receiving object, the fuzzier the cast shadow will be. If it's an object that starts close but ends far, same deal, even if the light source hasn't changed. Okay, so always think about this relationship between when it comes to cast shadows. That's really the most basic thing about it. Uh, working on a multiple object scene for Porch Studio, if you guys have it, so really helpful working with form studies like this. Yeah, that, I can't wait for that. Form Studio, we already showed you guys a while ago. Um, we, we don't know if we're going to keep it as a part of Porch Studio or separate from. Um, and then finally, I'm going to take a look at uh, this piece. Where are you? That floral one. So we can talk a little bit about color. Um, so this kind of reminds, oh, it is Ophelia. What am I saying? <laughs> I was going to be like, it reminds me of Shakespeare. Um, so I like the dead look you had, and I like how you are trying to use the same colors, but when we're talking about a dead face, what we don't want to do is use the same colors to, you want to show dead when you're trying to talk about Ophelia, especially if it's a character that's been designed and painted by so many greats. They all went with the same um, kind of like way of interpreting Ophelia uh, way after she, you know, not during or five minutes after she drowned. I'm sorry, the theme is so dark, but uh, way after probably when they found her. And um, so 
I'm just minimizing so we can still have this red it'll be a nice little touch but she's got that really eerie green in her eyes and you want to make that pop and red and green don't like each other they're enemies they're arch enemies so this means that when one is there they're always fighting for the throne and none of them wants to share the spotlight and so when we minimize that she looks like a lot less uncanny it really just looked like she had uh, red eyeshadow on and now this feels more like skin um, as for the blue I think you went a little bit symbolic with the blue so um, water isn't blue water is green and brown and some blue is there if the sky is particularly blue that day but it's always diluted so you might want to move more towards a turquoise so I'm gonna copy this sorry one second Okay, and then shift over into these colors. This could work well, but I liked her skin tone before. And then just, um, just grab her areas of skin tone. She looks like she's struggling to breathe because of this gesture. Is she alive or, um, so. So see that the colors feel a lot more warm and a lot more matched together. And um, the green of the skin, which is the yellow in the skin, matches the green and the blue, which is the turquoise. And we just have less of that intensity. You can get away with this with the abstraction excuse, but I don't think this is intentional abstraction. I think this would have worked better to deliver the theme. You also could have made her body a little bit more visible. So maybe there could have been more of a silhouette developing when someone's underwater. So you kind of just looks like she's floating in oil or a, a oil like um, like water in a in a like a lot of paint on the surface of the water floating. So um, floating in water. You can see that some people kind of see how that happens. So you might want to use some of this as a kind of atmospheric fade. Um, this is definitely something that, um, uh, you know, you could start applying to this piece. Just show where the rest of the body is underneath. And references like these, you can just reference them for color only. You can get color only references, which is another big part of planning. Uh, stuff that can't really escape you, you know, you'll always be able to um, have that um, control over your colors. But anytime a character is inside the atmosphere, which is what we would call the atmosphere of the water, they inherit the color and the edges kind of get distorted a little bit. So those are some of the corrections I would recommend. Um, just more balanced colors, less oil-like surface, and really the best thing I can come up with right now is just a smudge brush. This will really help you kind of get that watery effect. Oil tends to have these blotches, so oil spills tend to look like this, but water that's murky. And you had all these edges between each brush stroke that the flowers were barely noticeable. It just felt, for lack of a better term, busy. And then this coupled with some control over the flowers uh, colors, making sure all the flowers come from the same color wash would have just worked a lot better and then you've got that little bit of light in between her arms as the breathing room to kind of show off her body. Okay, um, around her face especially you want to soften it. She was described as kind of like an angelic almost if I remember correctly. And kind of giving her that skin tone. You can also just completely deadify her skin tone which um, might add to that eeriness. I'll make her look a little bit more dead and then use some of this blue on her lips and eyes which will actually also read as dead. Remember how we did our villain challenge? Some blue around her eyes and it'll look a little bit more like Ophelia. Um, if she is underwater, for the most part, around her head, um, then we have this right here. Okay, guys, um, this is it for our, our first time critique. I hope you guys enjoyed this today. 
Um, keep in mind that um, your Q&A section is always going to be there for you, so if you guys have any questions at all, save them for our next meet. Ask, ask on the server anyway, I'll answer as much as I can. Um, but um, it's, it's really important for you guys to write notes, interact. Again, it's about that changing your perspective and um, keeping yourself part of the dialogue. It's, it's all one extra way for you to learn in case you missed anything. It's another way to catch something. Um, and not always being the listener, but being um, you know, part of, the, part of the, the, the kind of theory, part of the discussion. All right. Um, I will let you guys go. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.